you, Gravity. Hello. How yeah. are you? Yeah, we're well, thanks. Yeah. Okay, uh, Council, I'm waiting, waiting still for Councillor Ladwig to join. I'm sorry, not Councillor Ladwig, let Councillor Lumley to join us, uh, but I'm sure he'll be here. Uh, it is 7 p.m. on my clock. Um, we have a, uh, a meeting with an agenda. We have two delegations tonight to go through, so I think we should start the meeting and uh, uh, he will catch up having just left us. Uh, so I'd like to call the regular meeting of Council uh, for December 15th. 2020 to order the time being 7 p.m. I acknowledge we're meeting this evening on the traditional territory of the Squamish Nation. Um, we have an agenda. Uh, now it is an amended agenda. Does council have the amended agenda uh, from them? Thank you. So um, motion to uh, receive the agenda that uh, uh, for the, uh, approve the agenda, adopt the agenda, sorry, for December 15th. Yeah. Councilor Kroll, Council Ladwig, uh, all in favor of adoption. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome the public who has joined us and, uh, and um, look forward to a good meeting. This is our last council meeting of the year. So there's a few interesting things, I hope. And then we'll uh, look forward into uh, to a bit of a break before we start afresh in the new year. So um, first item on the agenda is that the uh, Minutes of the regular council meeting held on December 1, 2020 be adopted. Uh, so make that motion, Councillor Ladwig, Councillor Kroll, thank you. All in favor of adoption? Thank you, those are adopted. And uh, any business arising out of those minutes, councillors? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on then to uh, delegations and petitions. Uh, this evening we have two delegations. Uh, the first one is Graham Starsage from the Gibsons Marine Education Society and uh, discussing the Healthy Harbor Project uh, report for 2020. Uh, welcome, Councillor Lumley. Uh, Mr. Starsage, welcome. And uh, you have a presentation for us or? Yeah. Yes, I do. Good, thank you. you well, the, the floor is yours, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Um, hello, Councillors, public, Town and Gibson staff. I do have a presentation for you today, which is short and brief with some high level points about our Healthy Harbor project for 2020. So I just need to figure out how to share the screen with you guys. And then I will do so. <clears throat> okay. Okay, first slide, Healthy Harbor Project 2020 report, virtual, which is uh, always a bit tough. I don't know how you guys are doing it, but here we are in, <laughs> in the strangest world. So for those joining us that I can't see, the general public, um, the Healthy Harbor Project is a partnership between the Town of Gibsons and the Gibsons Marine Education Center Society, which runs the Nicholas Sontag Marine Education Center, which you'll find inside the Gibsons Public Market. Uh, we have community programs, we have education programs, and we do our conservation work. And this is an example of some of the conservation work we're doing. So the Healthy Harbor Project has three main elements. It has a data gathering element, 
has the the ability to recommend policies and to provide the town staff and council with information to make decisions. And it has a community education and an ongoing long-term monitoring projects, which, we, which uh, we won't touch on all right now, but I'm happy to ask answer questions for people later on. Uh, what you see here though in two pictures is uh, the results of the 2019 Healthy Harbor pilot where we identified anthropogenic debris, which was fragmenting the eelgrass beds outside the breakwater, outside Gibson's Marina. Uh, in the top picture, you'll see Kevin and I and Bob Crawford. And here we picked up uh, some debris that was directly on top of these uh, otherwise healthy eelgrass beds, which would be impeding their growth and their productivity. Uh, we did that with a grant through Pacific Salmon Foundation, but it was really the work we did with the town of Gibson's the year before that allowed us to get that funding. And in the picture below, I, I reached out to Fiona Beatty and I just heard back from her yesterday, which you, you guys will know Fiona, of course. Um, this after we did our cleanup, we identified some larger debris and the Sea Change Marine Conservation Team divers came in and you see their boat there in that picture, uh, which has slightly larger capabilities. And they picked up, and I picked this picture because they picked up a large piece of matting. And what, I mean, imagine how much benthic layer gets squashed by having that suffocating mat on top of it, right? So no eelgrass is growing on top of that. So that's kind of, that's some of the restoration work that's happened as a result of the findings of the Healthy Harbor Project. Okay, so 2020, what we learned, high level, the, the Armour's Beach Eelgrass Bed is productive habitat. So you'll see a picture and I'm gonna do this thing that presenters are doing these days and wave the mouse around on the screen. This blue oval, we did our investigations or surveys inside that blue oval, which we're calling the north or the northeast of the Armour's Beach Eelgrass Bed area. Underneath that blue oval is the layers of eelgrass that the House Sound Marine Reference Guide, so Fiona Beatty and Diane Sanford had identified. So those are like uh, the 2019 survey and the 2014 and the 20, I can't remember the other year, 2013 survey. So the eelgrass kind of moves and shrinks and grows a little bit, but it's generally in these areas. So we had a level three eelgrass assessment, which is a subtitle assessment performed by science divers of the habitat in the blue oval. And it was, it was productive. It was signs of health. Um, the human impact inside that oval is minimal. Uh, definitely, we did. We also did a reconnaissance survey in the green oval, and this is for the, the second part of our 2020 objectives. And in that oval, certainly as you head towards the Gibson's Marine Landing Facility, which we've called in a report, you'll see more anthropogenic debris, well, because it's closer to the dock. Basically, it's easier for people to chuck stuff off there. So on, in 2021, we hope to get down there and we'll do a more thorough debris mapping. But you, in the report, which you may have read, there we didn't identify very much debris to actually pick up in this half, of, like in this year of the project. So we've kept on this, what we learned, number three, which is that the breakwater bed has the more significant fragmentation through human impact. We're still waiting on the results from the sea change divers, uh, you know, to see how much they picked up and where they picked up likely we'll do another survey over the area in 2021, right? Because they've been, they had been in that area by the Gibson's Harbor breakwater. And they'd also been over by the actual Harbor facility itself and under the airplane float and stuff like that, right? There's those anywhere, which is a stone's throw from the uh, a place where people can get to, there's more garbage, basically. Um, the other thing that we did, and this is important to the recommendations for uh, eelgrass conservation is we we surveyed the area and have found generally that in the Gibson's Harbor eelgrass is present to about 15 feet of depth at the lowest tide so the fancy term is chardatum but it's important because there's different organizations and different regulations that target this depth depth is so important right but what's also important is finding out what is actually present here in the harbor. So what this means is, uh, I think the House Sound Marine Reference Guide for 2019, it would recommend that moorage didn't happen below, above eight meters chart datum. So that means 
you know, 25 feet at the lowest tide, whereas we're not experiencing eelgrass here presently, like currently in the harbor, because we're not saying it couldn't be possible, but it isn't currently present in areas that are lower than 15 feet of water depth at the lowest tide. That's about the simplest way I can explain that. Okay, why it's important. So as the town of Gibsons will know and, and others who might be listening, the town of Gibsons has a natural asset management strategy. It's innovative, it's world leading. I uh, started with the aquifer and the stormwater uh, management plans. And now it's looking at the coastal assets and what municipal services that they might provide. And since the town has a recreational water lease, which is a, a unique feature and is a coastal community, which is another unique feature, it can look at how the natural assets perform municipal functions that which you would have to provide in a different way if you weren't gonna use nature. And one of the great things is that eelgrass uh, mitigates storm surge floods and helps protect for erosion, right? It basically dampens all those waves on those king tides that come in and impact the harbor area, which as we know with rising sea levels and with climate disruption caused by climate change and with the sea wall walk there with the sewer trunk line there, all of this is important stuff to take a look at. They also, we know that natural assets come with co-benefits such as for eelgrass carbon sequestration because it's a photosynthesizing plant and its roots all grow in the sediment, habitat for biodiversity. We know that biodiversity is a really important climate adaption. If you don't have biodiversity, you're, you're not gonna do well with, with changing climates. Uh, and it supports commercially harvested species. It's, it's, the, it's the bottom of the food chain. You know, it's, it supports the forage fish, which support the salmon, which support the larger economics of the province. Um, we also know that it, it, in natural asset management, that conservation and protection is much cheaper than restoration and rehabilitation. I mean, it makes sense if you can understand the services that your assets providing uh, and you can manage that appropriately that you won't have to try to rehabilitate it later. It's, it's much gonna, gonna save the town a lot of money in the long run. Uh, and I think that you guys are familiar with the Coastal Asset Valuation Project and the work that ESTA is doing and kind of actually providing, going to legitimize the value of the, the eelgrass in, in protecting damage to upland properties and, and the towns, uh, also their public spaces and services. So it, any conservation organization like us, it, it behoves us to say that, you know, once you've started your restoration, we, we don't want to have the ball roll back down the hill. We wanna continue on that good work, right? So we've picked up some, some debris, sea changes came and picked up some debris. You don't wanna put more debris back in the ocean. That doesn't, that's the, not the right uh, direction to go in if, you know, all things considered. So what happened next? Uh, we said we provided some recommendations in the report and you got the counselors have, uh, will read that I'm sure. Uh, so it will be available to the public, but there's essentially I have four drawings in here and a picture says a thousand words. And the first drawing is of the Armour's Beach area. And so these little green marks represent GPS locations. And we have ground truthed these locations through diving. And they are approximately seven meters from the edge of the existing eelgrass bed in an offshore direction or greater. And they also are suitable locations for anchors, which could have conservation signage, basically mooring boys that say, don't anchor here. Now, it's important to consider, and we've talked with the town planners about this, how far off you wanna have a buffer zone. You could create a 30 meter buffer zone from eelgrass. You could create a 50, go as far as you want but though what we did in practice because science is great in in on the computer models but you, we actually went out there and we in the boat created sight lines of what existing vessels were there in the harbor uh, what existing moorages were there and we we picked what i would call a happy medium sort of in a harm reduction model it's like how can we get this kind of project started to do some conservation without with by preventing any further damages that we can right now 
and with allowing a phased approach to conservation so that the other impacts, because there's other impacts once you start restricting access to the harbor and those need to be considered. And so I've got a list of them on the side. The town is, uh, has the appropriate staff and planners to, to address those as, as a Marine Education and Conservation Society, we're happy to support the town in that. I've just jotted them down. That list is not exhaustive in the report. There's some other, other details we can discuss those. Now the other three pictures, so this one, this one, and this one, we provide three recommendations in the report. And then it's basically like in this big green shaded polygon, we're saying nobody should moor there permanently or temporarily and except for recreational like kayaks and paddle boards, you shouldn't go in there with motorized vessels because this, this entire area is full of productive eelgrass beds. And it also has been highly fragmented by the impacts of humans over time. Uh, when we boom logs in there, the bark falls off and it creates a big mess of bark. There's lots of beer cans, there's matting. You know, it's, it's, a, it's not any, one person or one thing, it's just the cumulative effect of humans using the harbor. So to, we would like to focus still on, on cleaning up that, but to clean that up, we'd like to, you know, conserve that area. Now, you know, towns have to consider other things too. So here there's a picture of a smaller area, right? Which has the highest degree of fragmentation. So that would be sort of like a minimal protection zone. This would be like a maximum protection zone. And this, this here is like a hybrid model, which has a maximum project, protected zone. Now it's got this kind of caveat, which I anticipate would be hard to regulate, but may have benefits as well, depending on how you do your cost benefit analysis. Because in here, this, this kind of this orange shaded area, it's deeper there. So eelgrass doesn't grow there. So, you know, you, and it's a sandy substrate. So theoretically, Oops, sorry. You can have um, you could have moorage in there that wouldn't negatively impact eelgrass. Now, when you have moorage, sometimes a, you know a wind will blow a boat over, and then you'll have shading, right? And there's the access to the harbor. So there's Transport Canada, and there's like this the the way that you would create signage needs to be considered, right? It, it, you couldn't see we dot we dived these locations with the green marks, and we've established that well. This is the the channel marker what we would call the green lady so that we didn't dive that but we dived this as well and we if you just went out and put mooring boys here and here and here and here and they all had the markings of uh, no moorage eelgrass zone that wouldn't make sense to any boaters coming from out of town right it's very difficult like if you just drop them like this so you kind of have to like decide on an area you know and then if you have moorage by permit which is one of the recommendations then it could create, you'd have to have a high level of communication to people, which we've, which we've talked about the Marine Center doing is like having summer students and going out and meeting with uh, boaters and tourists and providing them with user guide. And we'd like to do that for sure in the future. But these are, these are some considerations that, you know, the town has to make. And so we're just trying to provide you with the evidence to, to inform that decision. And of course, we're happy to meet. We have a lot of Marine experience on our team and we have a lot of science experience on our team too and we're part of this community and you know happy to facilitate stakeholder hold our conversations as well if, if that was a thing that was wanted um so how do we get to this vibrant healthy harbor uh we support the town planning staff you know we listen to counselors we apply for funding um you know it's a big one that's you know my job uh, of course the town will have its own funding but i'd certainly like to examine that in in january to meet with uh the town staff and see if the Healthy Harbor report recommendations were going to be adopted, we would then go ahead and try to pursue funding from a variety of different sources to get these uh, signage boys uh, to make a design. We know the places we could put to anchor them. We'd have to check some of the regulations with Transport Canada, make sure everything was, you know, going to be tickety-boo with everybody. And then we'd find a way to get them installed of course, any installation has ongoing operation costs that need to be considered. Uh, oops, I keep doing that. Create a, you have to create some kind of communications, right? If you're changing the way the harbor works, you're gonna to have to tell people. I think that's kind of self-evident. Um, 
you have to implement these, I'm calling them conservation zones. I think this, that's the words I like, like versus, you know, no moorage or protection zones, because it's a lot about educating the community. Um, you're conserving the natural asset of the eelgrass that's helping protect the town from flooding, storm surge, sedimentation loss, further erosion. Uh, we, we know that we have to think about how this will roll out around to the south side, the Salish Sea side in future uh, implement like future years of the Healthy Harbor project. But right now that that's that area isn't used nearly as much by uh, navigation and boats. Uh, continue the restoration activities. Obviously, we always want to we want to do that. Uh, I'll loop back with Fiona and the Sea Change team to see if, like if they have more years coming. I'm assuming that she will be coming to make a report to Council too. She's just very busy with all the projects she's part of right now. And we'll continue the surveys and community programs. I mean, it, so what we've done now is we've established these baseline transects to do monitoring the breakwater area, north or Narmers Beach area. We want to do a few more, three more in the southern Armors area. And then depending on funding, time, capacity in the following years of this project, because we're in, now headed into year two of four, the southern, like the Atlee's Pebbles, Georgia Beach area. I guess here you see some pictures we have. We had got these from the, this is some more pictures from the harbor cleanup. And we had uh, the volunteers walk the breakwater while we did this subtitle cleanup. So that breakwater collects a lot of garbage. I mean, it's, you know, it's just humans make a big impact. So of course, a, a thank you slide. We really appreciate the support from town and council. Um, here you'll see the eelgrass displays that are showing the, teaching the local students and families about the Healthy Harbor Project, about the Natural Asset Management Plan. It, uh, there's to the right of this display, we're building a salmon stream display because we're now the DFO education coordinators for the salmon in the classroom program. So we can tie together the eelgrass story, the harbor story, the househound story, the salmon, glass sponge reefs. It all, it all works together because there's this bigger holistic kind of uh, vision of, of what we need to do as a society, like including the UNESCO Biosphere Initiative and, and trying to get uh, that accreditation. Mm -hmm. Of course, for people from the public, you know, I, I can't tell who's watching, we have these upcoming events. Uh, tomorrow night, Dr. Haroha Miller, she's the manager of the Ocean Watch program. So she authors, well, edits the Ocean Watch report, which just came out with the 2020 report, which monitors the health of the house sound um, on a whole, on a big level, uh, that's will be at 6:30. It's virtual, so you can log in. And then, the, and Wednesday, the, the second Wednesday of January, Fiona Beatty is going to be coming, and she's going to be talking about mobilizing community knowledge, which is going to be really great. I mean, she's a dynamic, but Aroha and Fiona are, are good colleagues through OceanWise, and we're we're all working together behind the scenes to try to advance conservation in the House Sound uh, and the territories of the Squamish Nation. So. I am open to questions. I put my email contact on there for the public who might want to follow up. And obviously, counselors and staff, I'm always available. Graham, thank you. Uh, very interesting presentation. I, I certainly have some questions, but I'm sure other members of council do too. And I would like just to uh, go back to one thing you mentioned, and that was the Biosphere Initiative. Um, I see a really real tie-in with our environmental uh, management and protection of this area and the biosphere initiative and that uh, um, we are going to be if that goes through we're kind of the the uh, the, the gateway to the biosphere uh, area uh, through Gibsons and uh, and uh, you know Horseshoe Bay West Vancouver being the other end of it other side of it and um, I think that uh, it will be a real uh, tourism attraction and opportunity, uh, people coming here for simply for that reason, uh, a, a kickoff for the uh, uh, marine um, paddle route uh, that goes up through House Sound and, and different aspects. So, so I think it'll be a real positive uh, for us. But I think we have to walk the walk, uh, walk the talk, uh, talk the walk, whatever it is, <laughs> to do that. Uh, and, and I think that it starts there. Uh, we have to also recognize that there are interests, uh, commercial interests out there in the water and, and um, the um, near the breakwater and the barges. 
uh, we do need to find an opportunity for those businesses to continue. Uh, and so that to finding a, a location where they could moor, whether we put the, uh, the mooring boys down, which might be a preference actually, um, at this point in time, uh, we don't charge anybody for mooring. Uh, I believe we could, it's in the recreation, our recreation lease. If we were to put more boys down, proper boys down that uh, were stayed in place and, uh, and charged for use of those, I think that would only be appropriate, uh, both for the recreation boaters and for the uh, commercial boaters at some point in time. I think we should work in that direction and, uh, and decide ourselves where those boys should be located. Uh, not taking away the opportunity, obviously, of people to use the area. So uh, that's kind of my comments at this time, but uh, I'll open it to council members uh, for comments or questions for, for you. Councillors? Councillor Ladwig, uh, Dean Drad, sorry. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Graham. It was an excellent presentation. Actually, you added more information than was here. I was really happy to see the Manion initiatives. Uh, I think they're doing a great job in Bowen Island, Manion Bay Rehabilitation. I don't know if Council is aware, but they are giving incentive to boaters to come up with their own eco moorage. So this is a project that I feel very uh, possible that we we do here as well. I think one of the the, the things that would help to decide uh, the shape and size of the the areas is really to have very clear our conservation goals. Because, for example, if our goal is to support viable populations of fish and other marine dependent uh, eelgrass species in the long term that would vary from just maintain what we have right now it could be that both uh, goals become the same that maintaining what we have now would support the long-term viability of these species but i think this is very uh, important to have uh, the goal in mind, because when we have to come up with the, the, the final uh, design, obviously, as Mayor Beamish just uh, mentioned, there would be competing interests, right? You have economic interests and you have uh, other interests, uh, users. Uh, and I think when you have this in mind, it would help, because even when I read the report, it talks about conservation, but if you say, what is the conservation goal? I think this has to be distilled a little bit more, especially like Mayor Bimi said, we will be hopefully the gateway for this community and we will bring a lot of uh, tourists as well. So there will be economic boost. So if we can, I think the overall goal is to maximize everything. Can we maximize our conservation efforts, right? Maximize our, our ecotourism uh, which also depends on conservation. So I think that, that would be my um, recommendation at this point that would be a little bit more clear because it will help, help to make decision. And I, I really appreciate that you are working with uh, uh, Fiona and Diane. And I really would like that they could provide feedback to this report because they are the experts on new grass, right? Diane has 20 years experience on this area. And Fiona's uh, thesis is about uh, restoration and conservation of eelgrass. So I think given the, 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 the uh, having their feedback will be very valuable for us to make decision. So, and I, I'm curious what's next <laughs> in terms of uh, council, uh, you know, how, when we're going to be talking this in, in another term. And sorry, if I, if I can say uh, another thing that I almost, uh, well, I think you did an approach in this report is what to do outside this conservation area, right? What kind of regulatory process we will have. I know you mentioned too, but again, I think these are things that we have to consider because there will have to be a balance of density, of regulations. And so hopefully it doesn't happen what happened in Purpose Bay, for example, right? That became a, 
a garbage uh, and a sewage uh, dumping area. So, but I, I really look forward to continuing this conversation and I really appreciate the, the start. Thank you, Councilor Dean Dryden. I, I'll just move on before we let you respond, Graham, and so that we can hear from other councilors. Um, Councilor Ludwig. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, once again, thanks, Graham. Um, great report, uh, great presentation, very informative. Um, it's really nice to see us starting to plan long term for sustainable human use in our harbor. I think that's fantastic. Uh, my only kind of takeaway for you to think about and for us to think about is if we do end up putting in buoys and, and these types of things, which I fully support 100%, but we need to think about enforcement and, uh, and management of those. Um, as someone who works on marine spatial planning initiatives with my other hat on, I can tell you that's usually the limiting uh, regulatory challenge with these things. So we just, as a council, as, a, as town staff, as, as the um, center, we need to be thinking about how we would collect those funds, how would we enforce proper usage of those buoys, how would we um, just manage it all together. And so I just challenge everyone uh, on this panel to put thought to that. I think it's a great idea. I love where we're headed, um, but there's just some logistical challenges to think about. Thank you, Councilor Ludwig. Uh, Councilor Crowell, Councilor Lumley, do you have anything you wish to add to the conversation right now? No, okay. Uh, Councilor Crowell? Um, just wanted to thank Graham for the report. And um, I was, I've, I've been involved with a couple of the um, sort of ongoing conversations. Um, there's a, a, a concerted effort um, going on in the community to get a dry land marina um, up uh, around the Avalon Logsort area with a boat breaking facility. Um, I one of the things that I find particularly heartbreaking is, you know, for the effort to be made in a beach cleanup and the next time there's a high tide and you walk back on the beach and there's so much marine plastic back on the beach, um, particularly along the area at the foot of the bluff. Um, I know bylaw has been very challenged in dealing with some of the things that go on uh, in, our, in our area. I think Mayor Beamish some time ago um, made, a, made a comment, something to the effect that um, our bylaw officer should have a, a boat. Um, the local search and rescue unit have um, offered services to our bylaw officer for things that you know that we can do with her to um, so, sort of help facilitate your efforts. We're we're not enforcement, but bylaw is, so we're certainly willing to extend that service to um, the bylaw department. I guess my question is, when do we have enough information to actually sit down and, and formulate some? positive action steps here, because I, I think that's what, we can keep talking about, about it, we can keep studying it. Uh, we can go into another year and in 2022, we'll be looking at another report. When do we have enough information to say, we know now uh, what we should be doing, everything pointing in one direction. Uh, because I think the community is waiting for us to take some resolve on this. Um, and again, it's, it's not punitive in the sense that we're not trying to put people out of business. We're just trying to say that the, uh, the business and the environment have to coexist and, uh, and we need to, to manage that. So, uh, Graham, when, when do you, what do you see in terms of further studies or are we at that point in time with the work that you've done or Fiona's done and that we can say we can sit down and start having those conversations and start making some concrete plans? Yeah, right. So great questions, everyone. Um, Bonnie Brookenshire is the manager of parks and environment for the Bowen Island municipality and was the lead on the Manion Bay revitalization project. Uh, we worked together before actually when I was developing docks for Wakefield on that Cape Roger Curtis mega dock project, which you guys may remember as being a disaster in marine planning and public relations. Um, so I reached out to Bonnie the end of September. We had a great chat. She's certainly on board with helping either the Marine Society or the Town of Gibsons share her knowledge. They have a license of occupation, which is different than the recreational water lease because they couldn't get a recreational water lease. So we, the, we as the Town of Gibsons have more, 
more robust mechanisms for regulating the use of the harbor. And that's a great, great start. Um, I, I won't go into all the, the learnings there right now, but that's so to DeAndre and Jet, Councillor DeAndre's point is we've, I've started to explore that relationship because I think it'll be very useful. To the, what uh, my mentor, Ann Dale, who holds the Canada Research Chair in Sustainability, uh, says to me is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So in this kind of harm reduction approach, what I've tried to provide, what we've tried to provide in the report is what's actually the smallest conservation area we can have. That will have, that will, by, by having it, it will be the smallest it can be, which will therefore have the lowest impact to any of the other activities, but it will still prevent any further ongoing damage. I sort of, I present this or see this as a phased thing. Let's go out there and do this right now. Let's use smaller, more, smaller anchors, smaller signage buoys, get it started. Maybe it's easier to start in Armour's Beach area because it, there really isn't any relocations. There's one swim float and there's the search and rescue mooring boys actually the only one that's in the directly in the eelgrass bed right now and that would be easy to move um right so we could start that to start the public education to get the buy-in uh and to test out the regulatory changes and the bylaw changes that would need to take place um to to O'Leary's point she's worked a, a ton in the marine environment so have i i mean yes there's, you got to consider that when you put something out there it's expensive it's going to start breaking as soon as it's out there uh, so we've tried to recommend uh, the lowest number of buoys, you know, spaced the best distances, just on what's actually practical, what may be workable, um, and what someone who, if they were a bylaw officer in a boat thinking about this from a, a, the management perspective, that they could go out there and really quickly make a delineation, hey, you're in the zone or you're not. Right, and that, that was the challenge with the breakwater zone is without boxing the whole thing off, the, the, that uh, judgment was a little bit more tricky. Of course, we, we realized that the, that the breakwater zone has that commercial activity using it. Which brings me to Councillor Kroll's point because I've worked extensively in, in, the, in the marine environment. You know, I worked with all, all the players, I won't name them, but um, there is nowhere to put your barge. <laughs> Which is, and you know, so a, a dry land sort facility that had more moorage uh, that was towards Avalon would be, a, you know, a fantastic thing for a lot of these commercial operators. It would it would take that operation outside the town of Gibsons, and that's like a bigger conversation than this meeting. But it is a, it's a it's a challenge. Uh, it's a challenge to have industry in in our sort of um, really green ecotourism focused economy which I think needs to exist but we still need the industry to make sure people can come and go from the islands to make sure people can uh, take care of their docks right like it's 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 a balance so yeah we need to but we need to pull them into the conversation so far at this point in time uh, we have not had that with them and uh, I'd like to see us do that early in the new year is, is one of our uh, our almost immediate steps is to have that broader conversation and the environmental aspect we 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 have people there but we have to recognize the other interests and and uh, and, and 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 let them know that this is not a threatening conversation it's a conversation of how can we coexist and and, and where, where can you moor as opposed to to leave the coast and, and and that's and that's the issue we have to talk about so yeah Bo Bonnie Brokenshire's experience was uh, as was a bylaw officer for the first 9 years before she became the manager of uh, parks and environment so that she had a really unique perspective on that and I think that's what helped build a successful model. Um, this well, is I think it. we're not going to solve it tonight but I yep. really appreciate the discussion. Last word Councillor Kroll. Um, just one thing quick quick Graham um, and sorry to multitask I sent an email to Dolphin Marine and Bob Crawford to come up with a plan to get our mooring can out of the eelgrass bed ASAP. So I've asked for a plan to have that happen. Yeah, I just talked to Bob about it on Scuba Claws Day. Actually, Bob's a great a great volunteer with us. A great, he's a chief marine engineer. The guy's a genius. He's an amazing guy. Okay. Okay. Thank you.
Graham, thank you very much. And thank you again for the work you do. And we look forward to continuing working with you next year and enjoy your Christmas season. Yeah, everybody enjoy your holidays as well. Thank See you later. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next, uh, Chris Nichols, the Gibsons and District Chamber of Commerce, um, to talk about the uh, uh, Forum Council update regarding COVID-19 economic recovery support funding. Chris, I see you're there. Welcome. Are you having trouble joining Chris or? You're unmuted, but your video is not on. You probably were. Now you're muted again. Unmute. There you are, got you. Got me? Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I guess uh, this evening uh, is just to uh, update uh, a follow-up to uh, Chris? The present. Chris, could you turn your, your volume down just a touch, please? You're, I don't know how the others are finding it, but you're kind of loud in my ears. Is that better? Yeah, we can hear you clearly, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, Stop yelling at it. it. <laughs> there's there's Stafford. Uh, I just I'm following up by uh, if everybody's read my uh, quick summary. It's just a follow up to uh, really going back to the beginning of the year when uh, uh, made a request for some uh, uh, funding support to help our initiatives in supporting uh, tourism and visitor activity. Uh, through our travel ambassador and our uh, information park kiosk. Of course, I uh, don't have to tell everybody, everything came to a screeching halt, but as we were closed down, our, we, we had to do what a lot of businesses did and we pivoted uh, in determining how could we support the local business community. And uh, of course, uh, just about all of that was through stepped up uh, communication processes to assist them in, in uh, keeping the community uh, aware of uh, what each business was doing and how they were operating and uh, you know what was uh, available for them. So that through, uh, that's where we incurred additional costs because uh, like a lot of uh, other nonprofits, we ended up with zero revenue in uh, terms of the activities that we normally undertake of workshops and uh, networking events and, and even our annual AGM, which had to be uh, canceled and postponed. So that's where, uh, in terms of economic recovery funding, we had to then, uh, of course, uh, implement, uh, you know, vir virtual meetings and uh, vi virtual communication processes that we've been involved in ongoing and engaging with our local businesses. As tourism was slow in starting off, our increased admin time of uh, engaging with businesses to get them to provide us with information of, again, how they're operating and for us to be able to communicate it outward, uh, you know, we found very supportive. And then as we uh, rolled into uh, the summertime, our, our uh, tourism kiosk uh, was uh, very busy from the standpoint that when people started coming to the coast, uh, as uh, uh, restrictions eased, uh, we had a lot of businesses coming to us so they, we could inform visitors to our uh, kiosk uh, who was open, what was happening, what they were doing, and how uh, people could access them. And one of the uh, key activities of that was, of course, uh, that uh, other visitor services were uh, restricted and, and uh, a lot of businesses weren't able to reach out and connect. So that's uh, one uh, activity did. And we embraced many businesses who were not necessarily our chamber member, but they were, you know, local businesses in the community who, you know, that's our mandate is to support all community businesses. So that was the primary undertaking in the summertime. And as everybody's aware, the summer started off slow in July. 
wasn't the best of weather, but by the time we reached uh, the August long weekend, our stats, which I highlighted in, in my note to you, our stats were back on par with our normal uh, summer activity. So if people wanted to get out of the city, this was the first place they wanted to get to. So uh, uh, a lot of businesses uh, we were able to support that way by directing people to them. Our second wave of uh, support that we did in the recovery, we undertook a program with uh, uh, Innovation uh, Island Technology. And uh, as everybody has evolved into or the, the digital world, which has accelerated in terms of uh, how people are operating these days, uh, we undertook a program to partner with Innovation Island and sponsored uh, a digital recover, economic recovery program of reimagine, uh, recover, and uh, uh, the third R, sorry. <laughs> but uh, from that, the, the benefit of that was we have 18 Gibsons, okay, businesses signed up to uh, participate with Innovation Island Technology and having their business examined with the uh, consultancy they received of how can they improve their business in this accelerated digital world that we're in. So we're looking forward to uh, uh, some of the results of that that'll start to show up in the new year as businesses have been, uh, it's been identified to them, here are things they can do and undertake to be more competitive. And just a, a quick sidebar that even ourselves as the Chamber of Commerce who we are, you know, I guess relatively digital in terms of how we operate. We signed up and, and through the intake and the consulting, it's been identified to us, you know, how, can, how we can be better in engaging and uh, uh, partnering with our local businesses. So all of this where, you know, we are uh, seeking the support of the uh, funds that were identified available to us is that we've had increased admin costs and increased costs, like I say, of adding on new uh, Zoom and virtual uh, business accounts, while at the same time, you know, our revenue stream has been uh, very much minimized and uh, we've been operating along in those terms. That's sort of what my note in a nutshell is and, and what I, you know, I think most of you know me, I'm probably much better at, you know, responding to any questions each of you might have. Chris, have you received the five thousand dollars from us yet? Have you? No, no. It was pointed out. I know it was on the books, yeah. but as we progress through the year, and you know, understanding the the situation everybody was in, we did not pursue that until it was identified that yes, you know, you you know, with a report that it was still available. So, as I say, our, our, the biggest. The biggest impact to us as a chamber was our revenue stream, which is membership driven, was severely impacted by uh, COVID. I'm sure our director sure, of finance director. would prefer that you access those funds before the end of the year, fiscal year, otherwise they carry over as a surplus in the next year. So uh, I'll leave you to talk to her and Penny about that, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. As to what they need from you. Uh, Council, any questions? Chris, the Chamber is doing a great job. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, participate in the swearing in of your new members recently. And uh, you have a full board now and uh, uh, looking forward into 2021. Um, we look forward to working with you. And uh, if there's anything we can do, I mean, there are going to be issues. And one of them is we're just talking about there is the issue of uh, balancing the environment and the commercial interests in the harbor area. Right. Uh, and uh, those are issues that I'm sure the chamber can help us with uh, in in dealing with those issues. So, well, right, and very much so. And and with this full board I have now, and and, and the board is has finishing off as we're heading into our our fiscal year end and, and renewal for businesses. And I know it's going to be a challenge for businesses, and you know, asking them for membership fees. But one of the things we, uh, my board is just going through, and I'll hear about Friday at our board meeting, is we went through an engage, uh, 
I guess, an engagement process of reaching out. Every board member reached out to a group of businesses and we had, it was really only about one question. And that question was, how can we bring value to their business as a member of the Gibson's District Chamber of Commerce? So we've had some, uh, uh, you know, I did it. Every board member did it. Had some very interesting feedback. Uh, and, uh, you know, I look forward to sharing that with you and I know Stafford will be at our meeting uh, so he'll be able to you know bring some of that information back also and just uh, finally we've talked about it in the in the past Mayor Beamish is we get into the new year while we're still all, all under this cloud of pandemic I'm we're finding businesses now understand how they have to operate what the controls are what the restrictions are you know uh, by the uh, provincial health officer so now they I find they're adapting even more, okay? Not trying to, I guess, get around things or how can I do it, adapting more. So that will allow us now to put activities in place that will, I think we can be more supportive of them. And one of the things we'll wanna do is finally get that sit down with your council with our board and just have, you know, an exchange of ideas and, and find the best way to do it. It might wait until warmer weather and when we can do it outside or, uh, you know, something of that nature. But uh, I think it'll, it'll be a, a worthwhile uh, exercise. We all look forward to that opportunity. One area that uh, I think that strategically the chamber would be interested to investigate is what are the opportunities that uh, businesses in other jurisdictions have found um, in terms of uh, environmental tourism, environmental uh, opportunities around being simply being declared as being part of a biosphere area in terms of a tourist destination. Um, there's a number of them around the world. It'd be interesting to see what the, uh, how that does impact because of the communities that are here, ourselves and Squamish, are going to be the ones most closely uh, impacted, I think, in terms of it being destinations uh, on that. So something to think about yep. in terms of opportunities for, for business. Sure. Very much so. And I've had conversations with some communities on the island, and, you know, and how they're approaching things. So, uh, you know, it's we're not we're not in our own little private bubble here. So uh, we, we've been able to, you know, uh, uh, I guess be enlightened of that there's uh, lots of things going on. So. Good, thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Gravity, were you reaching for your? Oh, no, <laughs> I wasn't, sorry. Gonna, yeah, unmute yourself, okay. Um, Chris, thank you very much for taking the time tonight and for- I uh, appreciate it. And uh, if there's anything we can do in the near term, but uh, please see our Director of Finance and man Manny for that Five thousand dollars. It was there were not strings attached to that. It was just to to, to assist your uh, work around uh, making it easier uh, in terms of the pandemic issues. So, well, just to let you know, it, through Innovation Island, and it was really the the Gibsons community that stepped up. It was a program offered uh, over the entire co uh, coast. A couple of businesses from other communities. Uh, you know, we're interested, and uh, as Screeda was, but the other uh, communities, you know, did not seem to want to jump on board. And I think we'll be able to demonstrate coming out of this that it's it's going to be a very worthwhile uh, venture, and certainly uh, in uh, enhance the competitive edge of Gibson's businesses. Excellent, thank you. We'll okay. see you next year, Chris. If thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Okay, Council. Um, is uh, uh, good to have those updates. And we'll move now on to our inquiries as the next section. Is, is there anybody in the audience who wishes to make an inquiry, a corporate officer? I'll leave that with you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. At this time, I'll ask anybody in the meeting as an attendee, if they have a question of counsel, to please use the raise the hand feature found at the bottom of the screen and we'll turn on your audio and video. And I'm not seeing any, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, we'll go on to uh, committee reports 7.1, um, Planning and Development Committee, December 1, 2020, a uh, recommendation that the, uh, the minutes of that uh, meeting, December 1, be received. Um, Councillor Kroll, Councillor Ladwig, uh, any, any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Those are received. 
administration reports, uh, planner one. Um, uh, this is the recommendation on the form and character for garden suite at 317 Headlands. And the uh, recommendation that the planner's report titled development variance and uh, development permit for form and character be received and would um, um, planner, are you going to introduce this, anybody? Um, I'll, I'll introduce it, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so this, this report is on a variance request for a garden suite. On December 1st, Council resolved to notify neighbors of the variance request for the proposed garden suite at 317 Headlands Road. The garden suite is proposed to be built above an existing garage, and therefore two variances are being requested. So one, to basically to accommodate the size. So the first variance is to allow the garden suite to be a total of 130 square meters. Um, and the current maximum in the bylaw is 90 square meters. Um, and this is because the living space of the garden suite is above. So the actual living space of the garden suite would be 74 square meters. But because of the way we measure it, we have to include the entire building. The second part of the variance request is to allow um, the, the second floor to be 100% of the first floor. Right now in the bylaw, it requires the second floor to be 75% of the first floor. And again, that's because it's above the garage and the owner would like to build a two bedroom garden suite. Uh, so two written submissions were received. One was in support stating the variance is reasonable and well considered. And the second submission was in opposition stating concerns over parking, shadowing and privacy. The submissions along with the staff response is attached to the agenda. Uh, the Garden Street requires an additional parking space on site and also there is a culvert running under the lane frontage of the property. The culvert will be removed as per town requirements and replaced with an open ditch um, and the ditch, the new ditch would eliminate parking in front of the lane in front of the garden suite. Um, in terms of privacy, the design guidelines limit the second floor outdoor space to reduce overlook to neighboring properties. The applicant has addressed privacy to the property closest with smaller windows. However, staff consider that windows should be located along the lane to break up the massing, to create a welcoming street front facade, and to provide natural light into the living space of the garden suite. So regarding the shadow impacts uh, that were raised, uh, the bylaw allows garden suites to be six meters tall in height and the proposal meets the height requirements. So there's no variance um, for the height and therefore it's staff's opinion that shadowing is not related to the variance because it could be built that high anyway. Um, so staff's recommendation is for the mayor to provide an opportunity for neighbors to be heard and, the and then the recommendation is to authorize the variance and the development permit for the garden suite. Thank, hey, thank you. you very much. Um, and before we go to council, I will give that opportunity for anybody who is in the uh, gallery and the neighbors who wish to be heard at this time. Uh, please make yourself known to the corporate officer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll ask anybody who'd like to speak at this time to please use the raise the hand feature found at the bottom of the screen and we'll turn on your audio and video. I'm not seeing any, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Council, um, uh, there are two recommendations there. Uh, first of all, could I have a motion to receive the report? Councillor Kroll, thank you. Councillor Lumley, thank you. All in favor of receipt? Thank you. Um, Council, the two recommendations that the uh, the variance uh, for a, a 317, um, or sorry, the development variance permit uh, for 317 headlands be authorized for a garden suite and that the development permit for 317 headlands road be authorized for a garden suite. Um, any discussion on those? Anybody wish to make those motions? Councillor Lumley, moved. Councillor Gladwig, seconded. Um, discussion? Councilor Lumley. I know the uh, the planner addressed the fact that 
uh, due to the ditch, there won't be any parking in front of the, the new garden suite in the lane. But I know the, the person brought up the fact that it's a fire lane. Like is, is, is any parking, should anybody, parking should be admitted? It, I'm just, I'm just curious. Should like anybody be able to park in that lane or should there be some signage in there saying you can't park in the lane if it is a fire lane? I'm just not sure. Like maybe they have a point to that, but. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we asked the fire department uh, what their opinion was it and whether they could uh, drive a truck down there. So they took their truck down and drove down and managed to get around, like get through the lane with the vehicles there. So as it stands now, if vehicles are parked not on the asphalt, then it's fine. There's there's room, but if they're parked on the asphalt, then it it decreases the the access, I guess. Um, so that is something like we, if that's something council wants to consider, we could um, I'd probably get a report on the implications of, of closing, stopping parking on along that lane. It's the entire lane, not just, not just for this premise. Yeah. Other comments, anybody else? Okay, now the recommendation removed and seconded uh, a, a request that the uh, um, that we look at uh, signage along the lane would be a second uh, a new resolution. So we could entertain that next if you if you wish. So is there any discussion on the resolutions as they exist? Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor of the rec recommendations? Okay. Uh, Councilman, did you want to make a further note relative to the signage? You know what? No, I would just, I mean, as funny as it may sound, I would, I would almost just, you know, if, if, if at any point the director of planning, uh, I know they got a lot on their plate, but I mean, Eve, there's a lot of these lanes, these small, narrow lanes throughout Gibson's, this little town. And, uh, I mean, you know, believe it or not, I, I would think that it would almost, even affect the uh, the STR bylaw as well, because if people think that they can provide parking in a laneway, um, they might be mistaken mm -hmm. if it's a fire route. So maybe in the maybe at a at a future date, uh, we could all we could look at all those lanes that may be fire access, and maybe as a council determine whether or not any parking should be allowed on them. You know whether or not they're half on the grass, half all on the grass. Not everyone parks the same, so uh, you know it's hard to tell. So uh, anyway, I, I leave it for the future, but uh, maybe just make a note in your books, and I have. So uh, maybe at some point in the future, we'll take a look at it for sure. Thank you. Okay, that's been approved and moved forward. So the next we'll go to eight point two, the Director of Infrastructure Services for twenty twenty cycling facilities upgrades for the Gibson's Way Tender Award. Um, first of all, could I have a motion that the report be received? Uh, Councillor Kroll, Councillor Dindra, thank you. And uh, is somebody going to speak with to this particular report? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry, but the Director of Infrastructure uh, recused himself at the last item, so he's just rejoining the meeting. If okay, you thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And there he is. Yeah. Oops. Okay. Just like oh, man, come on. Mr. Newman, you're on. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Lewish. Um, so the report in front of you is um, uh, dealing with a um, award of a tender that closes on December 22nd. Uh, and because of uh, council not meeting until uh, uh, 2021, uh, staff are seeking council's authority to uh, award the tender, uh, providing it was is within established budgets. Uh, if we received um, tenders that exceeded that, uh, and those were the only tenders uh, received, uh, we would uh, report back to council uh, in January. However, this will allow us to uh, 
uh, keep moving forward uh, on this project. And there are some potential synergies with the current um, uh, paving contract that is uh, has already been awarded. That's uh, pretty much all I have to say on this item. Um, and I'm happy to take any, uh, any questions uh, on this um, if, uh, if council needs any clarity. Okay, hey, would you intend to, could you report to council after the fact the results of the tenders and, uh, and those that were received so that we can- Sure, uh, absolutely no problem. Thank you. Yeah. So that uh, so council, so what's being asked as you understand is that they be allowed to be award the tender uh, as an appropriate uh, to an appropriate uh, uh, company as long as it is within the the budget. So, okay. uh, motion first to receive the report. Councillor Kroll, thank you. Councillor Ladwig, thank you. All in favor of receipt of the report. Okay, the report is received. Um, Council, what's your wishes? Does somebody wish to make the recommendation or do you have any questions on it? Councillor Ladwig. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor Beamish and Director of Infrastructure. Um, I was just curious about, um, to be honest, it's been so long since we looked at this project, I, I can't even remember the details of it. So that's sure. part of my question. Like, what, what is this for again? I mean, besides the fact that I know we're sending cycling traffic down uh, North Fletcher, but I wish we had a visual so I could remember. But the other thing I was um, curious about is in your communication, it says that you've been collaborating with TRAC regarding the planned works and have incorporated many of their suggestions into the design. Is this are there, has there been changes made since we last seen it? Just what, what recommendations did they make? And uh, the, I mean, the, the project itself is, is fairly simple and straightforward. Uh, we, uh, gee, I don't know, was it two or three years ago, we did the uphill bike lane um, with the multi-use path going up uh, uh, Gibson's way there and then uh, changing to an at grade uh, bike lane for uh, the remainder uh, up to North Road. Now we're doing the downhill lane. And so what we'll be doing, we had um, last year, we had the utility poles moved over to make enough room for this uh, bike lane. Um, we'll be uh, installing a curb, a concrete curb, um, a meter and a half away from the edge of the existing paving and then infilling uh, with asphalt uh, to create a at-grade bike lane. That will go from School Road or the North Road School Road intersection down to North Fletcher. And then we'll be directing cyclists down North Fletcher Road. Now, the reason we didn't continue it, continue it on, on Gibson's Way is uh, just lack of room. Uh, we have great uh, challenges there. There's an open ditch and even if the ditch even if we can close the ditch, there will be too many challenges with driveways to uh, uh, to get a bike lane in down there. So we felt that that uh, sending them down North Fletcher was uh, the the best way to to go. And then once you get down to the intersection of North Fletcher and School Road, we're making some improvements to that to facilitate a safer crossing uh, for cyclists across School Road and then down uh, onto uh, South Fletcher itself. Um, and that's pretty much the extent of the, uh, uh, of the project. Um, we are going to be bringing in uh, green paint markings. Uh, so those are, uh, you see them in Vancouver, a fair amount, and I think Seashell is just recently either planning on or, or has put some in, and that's to uh, identify high conflict uh, cycle, uh, high conflict areas between cyclists and, and uh, vehicles. And so because the cyclists will be traveling fairly or could be traveling fairly fast coming down Gibson's way, the intersections are gonna be marked with green paint. Um, and that is to draw attention to those uh, for drivers and for cyclists that there is a high conflict or potential for a high conflict area. Um, and then on uh, at least the narrower section of uh, North Fletcher, uh, we are gonna be putting in um, uh, the um, advisory bike lanes. Um, and uh, we are go also going to be having the first uh, bike boxes uh, in Gibson's anyway. And I'm not sure if Seashell has done that already. And that's where there is a, 
a green rectangle uh, in, in between the crosswalk and the vehicle stopping. And so cyclists can, can come in, park in front of the vehicle that is also stopped at the stop sign and then uh, go across when, when safe. Uh, so it's those sort of things that uh, we worked with track on. Uh, it was, uh, I felt very productive uh, with them and um, uh, yeah, I appreciated their, their input uh, um, on, um, on, on the design on that. Great, thank you. Other council, other questions, council? I see none. Uh, would somebody care to uh, approve the recommendation? Councilor Kroll. Um, seconded by Councilor Lumley. Uh, further discussion? All in favor? And uh, as I say, it's, it's subject to our receipt of report after the fact uh, uh, with the information about the tenders and, and the process. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. All in favor? Thank you. We look forward to having that project uh, completed uh, along with some traffic calming along North Fletcher that uh, which the people have requested. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Okay, next item is a, uh, on, oh, sorry, we're going down to Council reports, number nine, uh, an opportunity for Council to report on various activities and uh, issues they've been involved with. So I invite Council this time to put anything forward they wish. Councillor Kroll. Um, thank you, Mayor Beamish. Um, it's been sort of an interesting month on um, the first of, well, since our last council meeting, we had the intergovernmental meeting that uh, uh, you and I attended and uh, um, gravity. gravity was there as well. Um, so it was a, an interesting meeting. Um, that was on the 2nd of December. On the 5th of December, the um, Coast Cable, in conjunction with the Elves Club, hosted um, the Crash the Coast event, or as the fire department and the search and rescue unit uh, like to call it, is fill the boot. And this year was really interesting because we were concerned that people wouldn't respond um, the, the way they had in the past. And we were pleasantly surprised to see that we actually did $838 uh, better than we did last year. Um, Gibson's once again showed the Sunshine Coast who the generous community is. Um, between the Royal Canadian Marine Search and Rescue Station 14, who raised $6,987.50, and the fire department that raised $10,617, we raised $17,604 of the 26,000 that was raised on the entire coast. So, um, you know, really, um, you know, thanks to all the first responders who got out to support this cause. And also um, thank you to a very generous community. Um, it was challenging with, um, with COVID, um, I got butterfly nets for our search and rescue unit and um, we manned intersections. So we were pretty hard to get by, but it was a really great um, re response by the community. Um, went from that to the Gibson's public market. Um, one of their fundraisers this year was making tortillas for the holidays, um, 97 tortillas later, um, two days later, I emerged from the kitchen. Um, then on um, December 8th, um, and kudos to Elizabeth in communication. She worked with um, BC Ferries and myself. Mayor Beamish was involved in it. Um, if you haven't seen it on our website, BC Ferries have stepped in and have offered a very generous contribution towards the restoration of the Persephone. They want to work with us. Um, there is a video on YouTube, uh, Persephone Restoration, and Elizabeth has created a really good uh, link to the YouTube video on our town website for the uh, Persephone Restoration. Um, went from that, um, I was involved in the hiring panel for the CAT Committee, um, which 
there's some amazing talent around. Fortunately, we've um, we've managed to find someone, a new candidate who will be starting mid-January, uh, replacing Megan Barrows, who's done a fabulous job on the CAT committee. Um, but it was two days of sort of intensive um, interviewing potential uh, clients. Um, a bit of sad news this year. Um, it's the first year and as long as I can remember that the Royal Canadian Marine Search and Rescue will not be hosting the polar bear swim this year. Um, with COVID restrictions, it's um, an event that we just can't support, which is unfortunate. Um, I'm sure there'll be people out to take the plunge. So I only ask that if they do it, they do it safely because there'll be no life-saving um, facilities in place if things go awry. Um, we can't really meet COVID restrictions to offer the ground support that would be required um, for the event. And um, you've seen the event in the past, people are, are you know, literally on top of one another and it's pretty hard to go swimming with a mask on, it's like being waterboarded. So um, there are just too many things against it. Um, today, there was the anti-stigma training that was hosted by the CAT committee, which was a, certainly a valuable um, meeting and also an, an introduction just to, you know, the, the stigma dealing with, um, you know, people that have um, substance problems. And, um, then on the 20th, there is the, um, it was traditionally a, a dinner hosted by the churches this year. It's um, expanded slightly. The Salvation Army is involved. Um, Gravity has been very supportive. Uh, Elphinstone High School, uh, the culinary department are doing the cooking of the food for the Christmas dinner this year. Um, sadly, it's not a sit down dinner. It's a, a takeout and it's being, um, the Legion have provided their facilities for us to um, to do the food. That's on the 20th of December. Um, and we're still looking for volunteers who want to work on that. And that's me, Done. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Kroll. Yeah. Uh, Grab, do you have any report? Um, well, just that, um, yes, the Interact Club is, I think we have a fair few volunteers that are gonna come help out at Christmas dinner and our food drive finished and we got more than 4,500 items, which is fantastic. Yep. And um, we brought that all to the food banks yesterday. And otherwise, other than that, it's been pretty um, calm at school. Nothing big has, and just in the community, nothing very big has been happening. So yes, thank you. That's great, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, others, uh, Councilor Dean Dredd. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mary Uh Yes, I have uh, two events to report. Uh, I participated on the third, on December 3rd, on the webinar by the, uh, the West Coast Environmental Law, which was about coast and ocean protection law in BC. It was very informative. It's, uh, it's very complex. Um, I think uh, most, most of us understand because of overlapping jurisdictions, but it was very informative. And one I thought was very interesting because uh, in, First Nations are declaring uh, indigenous protected and, and conserved areas. And despite of the fact uh, that the federal government or the provincial government recognized or not. So there, it, it was very interesting to see the push for conservation. And obviously the goal of these marine areas is to support viable populations in the long term. So I was really pleased to hear that. But there's a, a 300 page material that has been published. Anyone can go to the West Coast Environmental Law website. And if anyone needs any understanding, that's it. It's a wonderful material, really well uh, uh, written and very uh, easy to follow up. Uh, I also had a call with uh, uh, the manager of, of uh, emergency service, Matt Strait. Just an update on the on the sea, community wildlife uh, protection plan CWPP, and if everything goes well, it will be uh, complete by April twenty one, April next year. But uh, the, there was a meeting on the twenty fourth 
that uh, it was actually called by the Seychelles nation. And again, they were concerned with the protection of certain species that are very important for First Nations. And so that's very interesting to see the push uh, to recognize uh, not only indigenous values, but which are a lot of conservation values. So I was, uh, I mean, there are some challenges, obviously, because usually the prescription for a, a wildfire protection plan is to clean the shrubs but these same shrubs provide habitat for species, for birds. So there has to be a compromise. And I was uh, pleased to see that, uh, you know, the, the community as a whole, it's accepting uh, this challenge. And I think we, we need to take this challenge. So I was uh, pleased that to, to hear this from the Seychelles Nation and to hear also that uh, the Sunshine Coast will be working towards um, incorporating this and addressing their concerns. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm not going to add anything to the report. Uh, many of the areas that uh, Council Kroll covered, I was uh, part of, including the uh, workshop today with the uh, um, community action team. Um, the uh, regional district meetings keep on going, and uh, there will be another one this week as well. Uh, before things wind down for the winter. Uh, I will be speaking a little bit more on the issue of supportive housing and the cold weather shelter in a few minutes. So I'll, I'll save my uh, my presentation till that time. So unless anybody else has anything else, we'll, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, uh, which is the school district correspondence. And the first item under there is the School District 46 Parent Advisory Council Road Safety in School Communications. Uh, first of all, a motion to receive that, please. Councilor Kroll, Councilor Ladwig, thank you. All in favor of receipt? Thank you. Uh, discussion, does Council wish to discuss it? I think it's consistent with the position that we have already previously taken on this. And just um, good to see that the issue is still acknowledged as an issue in the, with Ministry of Transportation. I, I think that I think one thing we should be doing is uh, probably as a council writing a letter to the new Minister of Transportation and looking forward to an opportunity to meet with that minister or the representatives in the near term in 2021. So we can talk about some of these highway and safety issues that uh, we have addressed as well as other parts of the coast. So, so that uh, we, should, we should be moving in that direction with the ministers. Councilor Dean Drive. Uh, are you um, contemplating like the whole Sunshine Coast, right? All the governments, it's more or more town of... I think we, uh, I mean, there is, we do have a, a transportation committee at the Sunshine Coast and the Councilor Crowell will be attending those meetings. Uh, so I think it's important that uh, some of the issues that we have raised, uh, we did write letters to the previous minister, Minister Trevino, when she was there. I haven't yeah. seen any action as a result of those. So I think we maybe need to, uh, reinitiate that those concerns, Councilor Kroll. Um, I think it would be beneficial that um, we act, act collaboratively. I know the same correspondence was that we've received in council has been received at the RD, and um, I know the District of Seashell has had some major issues with um, traffic. Um, also, um, and this is sort of related. At Sunnycrest Mall, uh, there was a person hit in the crosswalk in front of the cinema the other day. And part of the problem there is if someone pushes the green, the, the um, button to cross, they get the, the walk um, signal along with the green light. And sometimes visibility, there's a little restricted people turning left out of the mall by the Petrocan are not aware that there's someone in the intersection and someone was hit the other day. So I'm assuming because it is a Department of Highways um, intersection that, um, do we have any say in the matter of how those lights are programmed? Well, we can identify the issue around that sort of thing, but uh, the, and, and ask them to review the program of those lights, but uh, yeah. It would make sense that possibly that, that it's, um, maybe a delayed walk that uh, motorists can make their turn and then it goes 
that at least people are aware that um, yeah. there is someone potentially trying to cross because it's um, it's less of a problem with people turning right because there's less volume of traffic because people can turn right on a red light, but um, it, it is a problem. So I'll bring it up again. Yeah. Councilor Ludwig. I think those lights that Councillor Curl is referring to were highlighted in the report we received from the Ministry of Transportation. So at least we know they're aware of that, that issue. And I too almost hit somebody actually crossing that street. So I agree with you that it is an issue. Visibility yeah. is a challenge. Uh, how does Councillor feel about uh, requesting a meeting with the Minister in the near term? And should she have that opportunity? Councillor Kroll? Yeah, well, let's make that motion. Uh, we'll write a letter to the minister, the new minister of highways, asking for a meeting and the early opportunity. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Councillor Lumley, uh, go ahead first. I, I, I think I don't know if I've said this before, but like a, having a meeting is one thing, but uh, maybe having some sort of like protocol in place for like it just seems that all of a sudden, like you're driving up Gibson's Way and you're going, oh look, they're repaving the highway. It's just like you know, council, you know, that the first time I heard of it was when I was driving over it. You know, it's not like, hey, how can we widen this a bit? How can we make this bike lane? And then, you know, and then you're driving towards the ferry and you're going, hey, look at they're repaving this part of the highway towards the ferry. You're going, first I heard of it. How come there's no bike lanes? How come they're not widening it even for people to walk on? It just seems, and then like two meetings later, like, you get a 45 minute dissertation track on what they what they require and you're going okay like all, everyone's doing their own thing over here saying this is what we want but it just seems to be completely disconnected i don't know if a meeting maybe it's a start but it's just like i mean i don't know i mean uh, it's it's it seems to be uh, they seem to operate to the beat of their own drum i don't know maybe they're just not listening or maybe they 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 don't take what we think seriously but um i don't know if there's anything stronger we can do than a meeting but i would suggest it you know I, as a community it'd be nice to be in on some of their planning when it involves going through your community whether we own the road or they do it just seems to be um i don't know just seems strange to me so anyway those are my thoughts council ludwig I just want to fully second everything that Councillor Lonely just said there. And perhaps um, just, I was thinking as he was speaking, maybe one of the things we could be asking for is that the Ministry of Transportation uh, present any major uh, capital improvements that go through our municipality boundaries to the infrastructure committee. Share their, share their annual plans. Which, yeah. yeah, whatever. however they do their business planning that they should be presenting to our in, our transportation committee before doing so. Yeah. I think that's a reasonable thing to be asking for. We should be kept informed. Councillor Kroll? Um, it just, you know, to uh, address both Councillor Lumley and Councillor Ladwig, sitting at the regional district for a year, it became blatantly apparent um, even at the regional district, they don't report to the transportation committee, even though there's a Department of Highways representative sitting on that committee. And the last um, track committee meeting that I sat at, the local rep was, oh, and by the way, we've suddenly got some money, so we're going to be doing this now. And that was the notice we got. Yeah. Um, well, it, yeah. You know, it's it's unfortunate. It The ministries and... Um, Director um, Pratt has discovered it with trying to schedule meetings with multiple ministers that they op the, the a lot of these ministries operate in silos. They don't even talk to one another and their, their offices are side by side. Maybe uh, what we need to do is always send that letter and identify some of the issues that we want to discuss with them. And one is that pre-planning and, uh, and notification as well as safety issues along the corridor. And I would recommend that we do the, the letter jointly as Team Sunshine Coast. Yeah. Because, you know, one little voice from Gibson's is only amplified when it's well, has the other governments on the coast uh, co signing it. Should we put that forward then? Do we write a letter to the regional district, to the transportation committee, and ask them to raise that as an issue? Or? Um, track, I, I don't believe track are meeting now until the new year, but we could do that. It's. Um, 
Um, I would also um, ask last year, our, our communications officer did a really good blitz campaign on encouraging people to wear uh, clothing that can be seen in the dark. And um, here we are now, it's, you know, not only is it dark clothing, people are even wearing black masks. So it, it's even, you know, if someone smiled, at least you had a chance at seeing the flash of their white teeth. But now with masks on, you don't even get that chance. So um, I would ask that perhaps we do another blitz on, um, you know, wear visible clothing. At this yeah, I, believe that, uh, I believe that our communications officer is in the crowd. So yeah, probably take that. Councilor Lovely, go ahead. Well, maybe because it we we get correspondence and uh, uh, letters from other communities. Maybe just stopping at the SCRD, maybe that's not good enough. Maybe we should incorporate, like maybe we should like really, um, you know, design this letter to include probably what every other community, it can't just be us, I hope it isn't, but every other community is probably going through the same thing with the Ministry of Transportation. Maybe we should get everybody on board, like send it out to all sorts of communities and say, hey, like, you know, uh, if you're gonna blow through our town and start paving, Maybe we should have some say on it, right? So anyway. multiple hands up here. Everybody's got their hand up. So Councilor Dean Drive, you're next. Yeah. Uh, Let's have a motion, okay? <laughs> Instead of a maybe. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, somebody want to make a motion? Are you going to make a motion? Well, I was, I was just trying just to, uh, uh, to emphasize the same approach that we use with the Minister of Forestry. We, we managed to to discuss with them our frustrations and the letters that we have sent on the past. So yeah, put this and, and perhaps uh, liaise uh, for a better communication framework or be involved, have someone, yeah. Councillor Ludwig. I just really, again, I'm seconding Councillor Lovely. No motion, though. Everybody's got to Okay, well, and so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna make a suggestion, and then I'll, I'll make this motion if, if you want. Then maybe we should do this mail out letter, and that we should be making this uh, some type of resolution for UBCM. I mean, that's usually when you start to see those letters, you know, that come out from multiple municipalities, kind of gain, trying to garner. I have raised that with the regional district in the context that the uh, the frustration around the. Uh, Langdale School, as well as our own frustration with the crosswalk, as well as the frustration out of uh, Area E with uh, with the members having to petition the Premier for a four-way stop with the, with the uh, suggestion that we are actually mature enough to make our own decisions for the safety of our residents. And we have our own processes. And uh, why do we have to be at the, uh, at the uh, will of uh, Ministry of Highways turning us down all the time? And so we have said that, we have said that we need to make that a UBCM issue and is to say that we need, to, highways needs to delegate that authority to local governments to be able to make those decisions relative to uh, matters of safety within their own communities. Uh, and where the, you know, we have a different issue than, than the regional district has because all we have going through our highway is Highway 101 uh, from North Road uh, to the end of the boundary. The others are the highways that are responsible for all street maintenance, road maintenance within rural areas. But that being said, they have the same frustrations that we do. It's a not uh, a non-responsive ministry uh, issue. So, so that uh, we have raised that, and uh, as a, and in fact, we talked about it in, in the conference call recently with Katet Regional District, gained their frustration as well looking at this. So there is support for that already to go to, to UBCM with an issue on on uh, working with the, the lack of a working relationship with BC highways by municipalities. And so, uh, so I'm glad to hear that. But what I was getting at is I have found that during that UBCM buildup, yeah. it's those letters that go around to all the municipalities yeah. that really start to get gain traction. And we and would do that this rate. We, we, need, we need the UBCM resolution and that's what you, that's what you send out uh, to everybody is that UBCM resolution saying, please support our resolution at UBCM. So if we can craft that resolution and maybe that's where they go turn to the corporate officer or CAO uh, to craft a resolution for us that we could sponsor and champion uh, with other municipalities 
and, and maybe that's where we need to go. I mean, we're, we're a little bit all over the map in terms of what we want. We're starting at one intersection, but we're now dealing with uh, with uh, uh, strategic planning and things like that. But maybe we need to have that uh, that resolution crafted for us, and we bring it back to look at. I, I would support that motion. Okay, and uh, so motion that uh, the staff uh, prepare a resolution uh, that uh, covers some of the. Uh, council's concerns relative to dealings with Ministry of Transportation and that uh, it uh, resolution be drafted as a AVICC slash UBCM resolution for support of other communities and come back to council. Um, Corporate officer. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, if you could expand on the concerns so that we can get um, an appropriate response for council. Uh, well, the concerns I think we've heard are the, the lack of responsiveness relative to uh, to to requests uh, made by council um, uh, and uh, the the Seamount Way, for example, uh, crosswalk that we asked for, the the uh, bicycle paths that we asked for, the safe traffic safety, uh, and then also the uh, strategic planning, sharing sharing their plans for. Um, uh, highway improvements through our through our community, but also also through other communities, and the need to be proactive in, in sharing. The lack of I would be stronger than sharing their plans. I would have saying include uh, uh, the community on input to their plans. Yes, yep. Seek uh, advance uh, cons consultation uh, on on plans uh, uh, and the timing of their office. Right? All those aspects of things that they that impact us on a daily daily basis and our residents relative to to uh, the highways that uh, that are controlled that are out of our control, uh, uh, even though we are as I say a a recognized as a um, as a corporation under the community charter uh, responsible for our own management. That's one area, a corridor of, that we have no control over. So if you could craft something around that area that uh, we will we will recraft it for you as it comes forward. But uh, if we could look for that uh, sometime in the January, February timeframe so it meets the timelines for going forward. So it's been moved and uh, seconded by Councillor Ladwig and uh, further discussion. And uh, we will revisit this again, but uh, we're, start, we're starting the process. So all in favor? Thank you. Okay. Okay, council correspondence, uh, motion to receive the uh, reading files for November 30th and December 7th. Um, motion to receive, Councillor Kroll, Councillor Deandrad, all in favor of receipt. Thank you. Now does council wish to pull anything from those files for discussion? There was one that I'd asked the CAO to, and I just off the top of my head, I forget what it was right now. CAO, do you recall which one I asked you to kind of draft a response to? Is the new Brighton doc? Sorry? The new Brighton doc about a bow in, uh, Gambier Island? No, no, it's, it's not our jurisdiction. For you, Mr. Mayor, I believe it was the one on Park Road, the, the, the the multifamily site that uh, reached out uh, wanted some inputs around the trail maintenance and so on. Okay. I don't yes, that's correct. That. That's correct. The one that uh, that's right. Yeah, it was. We no. have responded and we've met with the gentleman. Uh, Tyler has done that and developed a, a plan for that trail. Good. And, uh, that was also just a few days ago. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, that was one that uh, needed addressing. So, okay. Councilor Deandrad? Yes, uh, it's a correspondence uh, on December 7, and it's from Gambier Island, and they're pretty much asking our support because, th did, did Council read the correspondence? Yeah, it's it being dealt with at the regional district. That's, uh, we, we don't have, we're not, we're not in the, um, in the, uh, the function for the docs function uh, within the regional district. So okay, because they, they are asking, uh, they need 500 signatures. No. So yeah. Yeah. But from, from who them? I thought we would be because, you know, we have a relationship, you know, they depend on, they come to us or no? I would say that they're, 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 they're area F. I mean, we can, we can add our signature to it, but that uh, we're, we're not, 
we were, were intentionally out of the function of the docs and the, at the regional level. Yeah. No, but I went to their website and they're saying the petition ha has been published on the House of Commons website and, and be a doc petition. We have until January 17, 2001 to get 500 signatures. And that's why I understood that will be signatures from municipalities to support, right? And Gambia I, Islanders come to depend on, on, on Gibson to a certain extent. So I... Yeah, I mean, if, uh, if individuals, I think there was very individual signatures. It uh, is. It is a petition, not, not, not municipality. But Council Kroll? <clears throat> The Gambier dock is sort of an interesting thing. It's um, currently the dock is con is maintained by the Squamish Nation. It's owned by the Squamish Nation, not maintained and, um, and owned by them. Yeah. They've in indicated that they're not interested in continuing it. Um, I believe there is there's a, a few things being looked at at the recent meeting with uh, MP Weiler and uh, the minister, the federal minister of transportation. The Gambier Island dock did come up in that meeting. Um, obviously, the federal government is not interested in reinvesting in government docks. So it, you know, yeah, it's a huge dilemma. It's, um, it's, you know, it's BC ferries use it. It is the primary access to Gambier Island. Um, you know, people are welcome to sign the petition, but it, as Mayor Beamish suggested, um, it isn't in our jurisdiction to, um, you know, so, you know, it, the petition is there, people are welcome to sign it, um, but it's, it's um, you know, it's awkward for a municipality to venture into something that isn't within our jurisdiction to. Um, That's fine. To, yeah. the, uh, the history of it is what it was uh, devolved by the federal government several years ago and the Squamish nation took it on. They, uh, they are now asking that the regional district take it back, take it on as a function, as opposed to being sold to a private interest uh, who would operate it. So that it's a little bit complicated. It's, uh, but it, it, it's say it, at, at the regional district, I don't vote on that issue. Uh, it's, it's on the table, but it's not something that the town of Gibson votes on. Okay. Yeah. Um, just as an FYI, there are nine docks currently that the regional district uh, maintain, um, and the, and they're all within the rural functions, not the municipal. Functions. And they actually do have docks on Gambier Island that they maintain. So, in yeah. yeah. Okay. Nothing further out of correspondence. Uh, um, go to the uh, item 10.3, which I added earlier today, and I hope councils had a chance to read that. And it, it, it's born in a little bit of a frustration um, that uh, at UBCM, take you back to September 17th, uh, we had a conversation with um, uh, Naomi Bruckmeyer with BC Housing, and uh, it had to do with the cold weather shelter. And at that time, we were expressing our concerns about the um, lack of planning that is surrounding the establishment of the shelter, the lack of services uh, that the province is putting in place to help make the shelter residents, uh, help them be successful. Um, and we looked at uh, the lack of supports for uh, ongoing mental health and addiction counseling, help with integration in the local community, employment opportunities, and other supports that will help them to succeed in our community. Um, and we had a conversation, as I say, with uh, uh, BC Housing that time, and I left with them nine questions. And uh, those nine questions we provided to them in the briefing note that we, we used. And they all were around, you know, what is the role of BC Housing in Rain City providing supports? Uh, what steps does BC Housing take to ensure success of their residents? What is the role of the Community Advisory Committee in the community? All the questions that we have relative to this new program that's being established in, in Gibsons. Uh, and, the, and, the, and very much the lack of communication that we've had about it uh, since approving the process, uh, the, the program earlier this year or late last year. Um, 
combined with that was a cold weather shelter more recently. And, they, and that was the issue of uh, suddenly we find that uh, there's no plan for a cold weather shelter uh, in Gibsons. Uh, we started the conversation. We had a meeting here at the office, uh, a meeting, I guess, online with, with several persons. And, uh, and then we, um, ideas came up uh, forthcoming. One was to have it at the, uh, with the regional district in the, in the, um, uh, the um, region, in the recreation center we have in town here. Um, we looked to try to get, uh, gain, engage with BC Housing on that, uh, gain unsuccessfully. Uh, lack of communications around the issue. We, we weren't hearing anything back from them at all. Uh, and very frustrating because if we're going to go into a relationship with them on, on the support of housing, you know, how is that going to work out in the long term if they're not communicating with us? And um, more recently, and uh, it was on um, uh, last week, I sent out an email and um, um, I said, I, I question the plans to open supportive housing and school road, given the lack of communication and cooperation BC Housing has demonstrated to our, to our council before the supportive housing project is completed. If the project has to be delayed in order to get their attention in response to questions put to Naomi during UBCM, then so be it. Currently, I suspect they will open the supportive housing and walk away from any responsibility for its success or the success of the residents and the impacts on the surrounding neighborhood. And we sent that in email to, uh, to council as well as to our um, MLA, Nicholas Simons, who I'm aware sent it on to Ministry of Housing uh, as well. And again, it, it, there was no response forthcoming until today uh, before this meeting. And I shared that response with you. Um, the issues that I have around this whole thing is that we seem to be pushing. Uh, subsequent to the UBCM meeting, uh, we received a correspondence from, uh, from Naomi and uh, acknowledging the questions, acknowledging that we, were, we had some concerns. Uh, her response was that uh, I think an imperative to assure that we have appropriate people at the table to spe specifically address the discussions around the services required to meet the needs of the tenants. To that end, we'd like to include um, BC Housing, Vancouver Coastal Health, Green City Housing, and other referrals from collaborative access tables like the CLBC, which I'm not sure what that is. We can work to set the date and get the right people present for the first week of November. Great, that was a positive response. Nothing, nothing happened as a result of that. Uh, we now have a response that, uh, that talks about uh, getting together. Well, the next response came is to get together in uh, later in November. And now we have another response that says, hey, we need to get together and talk. Um, I think they're only listening to us. They only respond when we come in terms of a fairly aggressive action on our, our part, uh, not from a proactive step of saying, hey, we're coming. We have a program in your community. How can we work with you? Uh, in September, they came forward and they asked for an appointee to the community um, advisory committee. Uh, council appointed Councillor Ladwig, who had volunteered to take on that role very early uh, in the process. Um, and last week, we got an email from them asking us if we would appoint somebody other than Councillor Ladwig because they didn't want a councillor on their committee. And um, my response to that was no. Uh, we feel that it's appropriate to have a counselor on your committee. And if you want a staff person to assist her, we will consider that. And they came back immediately and said, oh, we've reconsidered our position, that's fine. Uh, it seems we have to take a strong position with them in order to get anywhere. Otherwise they, 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 they're, they're dictating to us. So today the email we got today, uh, which I have made public, and I did ask uh, Naomi to, for permission to share it tonight at the council meeting. Uh, again, it's a uh, head of the council meeting today. This is as a result of my note last week. I want to reach out and provide an update on the school road project. We are ready to inform you that new supportive housing is on track to open in February. Now we've heard mid-January, third week in January, now we're here in February. It's a moving target again with this. We just don't know when this is going to happen. 
We have worked with the town of Gibsons and our contractor to ensure the time that the timeline does not slip further and appreciate your ongoing support and patience during this process. As you're aware, the new housing will provide 40 permanent, permanent supportive housing for residents in Gibsons who are experiencing homelessness. We're committed to working with you and the community to ensure the successful integration of this project into the neighborhood. neighborhood. This includes the establishment of a community advisory committee. Now, this is the first correspondence we've had with Naomi and BC Housing since September, or since her response to our giving her the copy of the briefing note in September. Uh, I've reached out to my colleagues in operations for an update on winter shelter operations. We recognize the urgent need to have safe and secure housing at Gibsons during the cold winter months. We've been exploring a variety of options in terms of space and building capacity to serve as an emergency winter shelter. While there are spaces available, unfortunately, there are not enough nonprofit support staff available, despite available funding, to provide additional shelter supports on the coast right now. To address this, we have booked rooms at Blue Sky Hotel and Sea Shelter beginning Monday, December 14th. Some guests on emergency shelter and sea shelter were referred to the hotel. This will free up some capacity in the shelter to refer those in need from Gibsons. We're continuing to work with our community partners to free up as much space as possible to shelter and sea shelter and continue to look for alternatives to open options in Gibsons. Right now, their only option is the same option they had a month ago when we talked, and that was to put people in taxi cabs or the bus and send them to sea shelter which I'm sure Sea Shelt is not, uh, uh, would not welcome. We look forward to continuing to work with the town of Gibson to address affordable housing needs in the community. We would like to arrange a meeting between yourself, Rain City and BC Housing to discuss in more detail how we can work together to ensure the successful housing and services for those experiencing homelessness in your community. Please let us know when you might be available to continue this conversation where we can address the questions and concerns you raised with me during our call to UBCM. You know, I'm certainly prepared to meet with them. I'm certainly prepared to, and I'm, I'm sure some other members of council would be prepared to meet with them. But it is always as a result of a overt action on our part, taking an initiative, pushing them to the wall, uh, contacting our MLA saying, we're hearing nothing, we're getting nothing. And suddenly the hand is open and say, oh, we're pleased to meet with you. Uh, it's extremely frustrating, extremely frustrating this winter to see that uh, we do not have an alternative in Gibsons for homeless people who to get out of the weather. Uh, we've been fortunate to be reasonably mild, uh, but not every day is a comfortable day in the outdoors. And we need to respect that with people. Everybody needs that opportunity to have, have respect. So my suggestion to this is that yes, I would like to answer positively that we will meet with them. I don't know if other council members are interested in doing that uh, uh, within, uh, I will respond if council agrees, we'll write a letter back and we'll try to set a date uh, uh, later this week or next week to have that meeting. Um, it's gonna be a discussion, but I am concerned with that whole thing of, if this is our relations with BC Housing today, how is it going to improve relative to the supportive housing and issues that come, from, come rise from supportive housing? I believe that community, uh, community advisory committee should be in place before the community, the supportive housing goes, it gets established so that it can begin to address some of the concerns that the residents have already raised. And, and I, I believe that we need to enforce that with them. And, uh, but I, I am prepared to, uh, council agrees to go back on this email and uh, agree that we will meet with them and see if we can arrange something uh, before they take a Christmas break, because frankly, they took a break because the election was on. I don't know why public servants don't work during election periods, but they said because the warrant was dropped, they couldn't meet with us. That makes no sense uh, because they continued to get paychecks. So, Councillor Lumley. Yeah, I, I think one of the problems is that the two, uh, the two issues are, are being blended together which only muddies each issue. I would, I would suggest that, first of all, um, somebody from Shack should be at the meeting yeah. and somebody from Shack should sit on that uh, committee. Those are the first two things I would suggest. I've had expression of interest from Shack on that. Yeah, and then 
the other thing is that we just you just have to i mean as much as they want to push it back onto the the shelter i think you just got to push it back onto the fact that people are are out on the streets cold yeah. and you know that's the first priority is that yeah. uh, and then let's deal with the shelter uh, once we get that sorted out then you can move on to the other issues with the shelter combining them or talking to them at both at the same time i just think that's the wrong way that's it's a lose-lose i find the big issue is out of communication uh, you know if, if we had an avenue of communication if they were responsive to us on one issue we could build that conversation around the second issue so it really is a big communication issue councillor crow this sort of you know seems to go back to the silo issue and and one department not talking to the other you know, they're saying not having staff. Um, we raised the situation that last March when the, when the Gibson's shelter and the Marine Room closed, that there would be a need for a shelter regardless of the supportive housing being in place. And at that time, the supportive housing was due to be open in late fall, um, you know, late October, early November. Um, Having said that, thinking that the shelter was supposed to be open, I question why people weren't being trained to operate the shelter. So it seems to be, you know, BC Housing is running around quick, we have to house the homeless, but they're totally disregarding the fact that someone has to supervise these shelters and operate the shelters. So there, there's, there, there's obviously a, a, an apparent disconnect I'm suspecting with the huge efforts that are being made be, by, between the city of Vancouver and BC Housing that resource operators are in short supply. It's not a problem that's unique to us. It's, it's you know, nationwide and, and certainly province-wide. So staff is a huge issue, but why they haven't been addressing that this upfront just boggles my mind. Um, Mayor Beamish and I attended the, the CAT committee um, meetings when we were first elected. And our walk away from that was resources, at feet on the ground resources are stretched to the limit. And that was when the, um, that was when the, the shelter, the supportive housing in Sea Shelter had just opened. Now we have a, an expanded winter shelter. We have motels and hotels that are supporting homeless, um, the Salvation Army strapped and what they're trying to do. And, um, you know, the success of our support of, of sh our support of housing, you know, it is being compromised by this lack of resource coordination between departments. Um, so I think it's the sooner we can meet with um, BC Housing, um, you know, and, the, you know, us talking is not solving the people that are sleeping out in the cold um, at the moment. You know, have you tried ever tried to call a cab at seven o'clock at night in the town of Gibsons? And, you know, what, you know, I don't know if the, the cab operators, you know, are mandated to have to carry people to sea shelter if they don't want to. So what's plan B? You know, does the person have bus change? You know, it's. You know, there's just, you know, right now I feel there's so much lipstick being put on the pig, it's embarrassing. But worse than that, it's, it's um, you know, it, it's a neglect of, of humans in our community and it's deplorable. So the sooner we can move on it, the happier I'd be. Thank you, Councillor Kroll. Before we move uh, on, I'm going to ask for a uh, resolution to extend this meeting, and I believe. 15 minutes should be sufficient. So till 9.15. Councilor Kroll, Councilor Ladwig, all in favor? Thank you. Uh, Councilor Ladwig, you had indicated you wish to talk. It's already all been said. I mean, I in my 20 years of government, I when this whole project was being rezoned, I had never experienced such a such a significant degree of lack of transparency and respect from another government department. And I I, it's continuing, so it's a disappointment to see. Anyways, yeah. I really support yeah. you in trying to connect with us. Yeah, I've tried to express that in terms of the, the lack of, uh, if this is the level of communication we're receiving today, how is it going to improve uh, two months from now if we don't do something about it? Uh, and so that 
I am prepared to respond in a positive way to Naomi to uh, 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 request that we meet before Christmas um, later this week, if possible, so that, uh, uh, and uh, I will inform council what those plans are. Um, I'll work with the CAO to set that up and uh, contact her and see what her availability is uh, this week. I am busy on Thursday morning with uh, uh, the SCRD, but uh, other than that, I think my, my time frame will be available. I'll make sure I'm available and uh, we'll let others know what that is. So if you want to come on the line to, to share that conversation. So, yeah, it's frustrating, but uh, it's frustrating because this is a very important project. I think we have the mental health in there as well. Mental health, I understand that the, uh, that the marching orders, the Minister of Mental Health, uh, the, the letter from the Premier was that they, to provide supports to the supportive housing programs as well. So I think so. We need to be working together on these, these issues. Okay. So we will do that and we'll ask that uh, mental health be at the table as well, as long, along with Rain City. Okay. Anything further on that? Um, it's a frustration. Uh, sorry, we have to have those frustrations. So, moving on then to bylaws, we got the um, 2021 anticipation borrowing bylaw number 1286 for adoption. Somebody can move that. Councillor Kroll, Councillor Lumley, thank you. All in favor of adoption? Thank you. That is approved. Adopted. Uh, financial plan amendment bylaw. 127601. Um, first of all, that the director of finance report titled financial plan be received. Um, director of finance, would you want to say any more about that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I can uh, give a brief overview if you like, or if it's self-explanatory, I can leave it at that, whatever you counsel. No, we can we, we make time for you. Okay, you great. Stay with us this long. <laughs> Thank you. So this is uh, really a housekeeping item that formalizes uh, the budget authorizations that Council has made since the adoption of the financial plan back in May, and it formalizes those recommendations into the financial plan. And so a total of just over 2.2 million has been added to the original financial plan, and this reflects grants received, transfers from reserves, and expenditures arising from specific events uh, which impact the general and the water funds. That's a really large number. The bulk of it is, uh, as you are aware, the 1.5 million we received for the COVID funding. That's why that number is so big. Uh, the items listed are listed in the report and uh, I've incorporated them into the amended financial plan, uh, which is attached to this report and it's presented today for three readings. And then it would, if that goes ahead, then it would be brought back in January for adoption. Thank you. Yeah. Council, do you have any questions? Okay, did we um, motion to receive, did we receive it? Did I get a motion to receive? Okay, so so then uh, somebody care to um, move the uh, first, second, and third reading of uh, bylaw 1276-01-2020. Councillor Kroll, thank you. Councillor Dindrad, thank you for seconding. All in favor of adoption? Thank you very much. And uh, next at the Director of Finance Report titled Short-Term Capital Boring Bylaw 1234-2016 be received. Motion, Councillor Deandrad, thank you. Councillor Kroll, all in favor of receipt. Thank you. And uh, go back to the Director of Finance, uh, if you'd like to uh, explain that. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this is also a housekeeping report. And in this case, it's to close up the borrowing that was authorized under bylaw 1234. And so the total amount of borrowing authorized under that bylaw was $125,000. Only $88,000 was required, and that was back in 2017. Uh, and it leaves behind $37,000 that is unissued. At this point, that 37,000 funding is not required under this specific bylaw. And I'm requesting that council pass a no further borrowing motion. And this closes out the borrowing authority under this bylaw. And this enables the uh, then the full amount of short-term capital borrowing that's authorized under this section to be available for future uses. Okay. Thank you. So to be clear, this itself is not a bylaw we're approving. We're just saying they say no further borrowing resolution. 
That's right. It's a formality that really closes it out. Otherwise, what happens is uh, if we if council chooses not to, which is your uh, purview, is that this bylaw stays open until the end of the five year term, which would be the end of 2021. This is just closing it out because we're not going to need it. And um, then I can move on to uh, other purposes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, will somebody make the uh, resolution? Councillor Kroll, Councillor Deandrad, thank you again. Uh, all in favor? Thank you very much. It, uh, nice to cancel out plans that we don't have to go into further into debt. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're now on to item 12, new business. Is there any new business? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to inquiries. Corporate officer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. At this time, I'll ask anyone in the meeting as an attendee to please use the raise the hand feature if you have a question of council and we'll turn on your audio and video. I'm not seeing any, Mr. Mayor. Okay, well, I'd like to thank all the attendees for being present tonight and uh, putting up with us. So uh, the next meeting uh, will be held on Tuesday, January 5th, 2021 at 7 p.m. And um, is that the day after New Year's Day? No, I guess it's probably not in this calendar. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't believe so, Mr. Mayor. No, okay, yeah. yeah. So that being said, then let's have a motion to adjourn this meeting. Councillor Kroll, Councillor Ladwig, all in favor of adjournment. Thanks everybody. And uh, I'll let you know about the meeting with BC Housing. And uh, otherwise, if we don't meet again, have a great season, have a good break, relax. Um, we'll be around the office. Don't forget to get your raffle draws uh, for the baskets. Uh, the money goes to a good cause. It's, uh, and uh, don't forget if you um, uh, wish to volunteer or participate in the community dinner on the 30th, uh, come for the food, come for the volunteers, bring your kids, there'll be gifts. Um, we'll be wrapping gifts on Saturday morning. Yeah, Council Deandrad? Oh, no, because you said on the 30th, the dinner oh, sorry, is... On the 20th. <laughs> Don't come on the 30th. <laughs> It'll be too late. <laughs> on the 20th, uh, the Sunday the 20th at, uh, at 3 p.m. And as I say, we'll be wrapping gifts on Saturday morning. Uh, and uh, so people will have the opportunity to pick up a gift for the child, their children, and take it with them with a, with a meal. Okay. Councillor Cole? I just wanted to clarify that it isn't a sit down dinner this year, that it no. is. Take out. Take out. Just, just, just like uh, Councillor Lumley does, take out dinners. Yeah. You can either come to the community dinner or go to Smitty's, whatever you choose. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thank and uh, we'll staff, thank you again. Uh, this is our, maybe our last time to meet this year. So that I uh, hope you guys all have a good season as well and uh, take care of each other. And uh, thank you for all you do. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thank yeah. you everyone. Bye. Merry Christmas.